Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, I know a lot of folks have traveled across the country. Um, my name is Mike Sabota. I'm a senior staff engineer at LinkedIn. Uh, specifically, I work in production infrastructure engineering. Um, that means uh, I'm in the team that, that manages a, a large uh, population of our servers. Uh, this is my LinkedIn profile. If you want to connect with me, we can be friends. And uh, the slides that you'll see today is on SlideShare, but it's also on my LinkedIn profile as well. So you can click there and get a copy of these. So <clears throat> this is what we'll talk about today. Um, what are some of the problems that LinkedIn faced? Why did we look at creating this technology, um, specifically moving machines around the data center? And um, it was great that we just heard this presentation from Nina because we're going to be driving into this a bit more about horizontal uh, versus uh, vertical network architectures. And finally, what is this technology that we're talking about? So why do we create DFW? DFW stands for Distributed Firewall. And the first problem we had was um, moving machines around the data center to create DMZs and how that was a scaling problem, right? So what is hacking? What is script kitty hacking? Um, if you're thinking of someone that has no hacking abilities at all, what are they going to do to try to penetrate your network? Um, they're going to try to get a foothold. They're going to try to run port scans, ping scans, figure out what services are listening to well-known ports. Um, See if they can enumerate that. Like, can I get the version of Nginx or Apache? Um, are there known exploits against those versions, right? Can I use those exploits to get data out of those systems? And the script kiddies, what they're after for is data, right? They're not necessarily interested in cracking into systems and getting root access. Data is what's valuable. So this was a huge wake-up call for us, right? Because let's say I had an application um, and I had 500 or 1,000 different instances of this application. And let's say our house security team came to us and says, um, we need to provide isolation for this application. There's something that we need to provide additional security for. So what are we going to do to, do, to provide the security? And our only response was to create a DMZ, basically to put the machines behind a network firewall. And this either meant uh, unracking and re-racking machines in the data center, or physically changing how they were connected to the network, rerunning cabling. Um, this did not scale, right? This may be one application out of thousands at LinkedIn, um, and we just we can't do this. So we had to come to take the approach that we had this trust of the production network. Like once you were inside the production network and there was a network firewall, you were secure. And we kind of looked back and said, you know, this isn't the right direction our approach. If we treat our production network as if it's the public internet, we could get a lot more secure. Um, and here's an example, right? I think everyone's kind of familiar with this example where you have an employee within a company, um, they either click on a bad link or open up a bad email attachment, and now there's malware uh, installed on their machine. And maybe their machine's located within an office network, and they're able to use that to pivot into um, a QA environment or a staging environment, or maybe in a production environment to start siphoning data. So um, again, the hacker who's now taking control of this machine inside the office um, can turn around and exploit resources that they really shouldn't be able to have. Um, and if we start thinking about this, like the, the most recent example is the Equifax leak, right? What happened here? Um, I don't personally know the details of this event, but the high level that's been described to me is that there was a front-end application that had a known vulnerability. Um, someone was able to crack that application, and then they were able to use that to pivot and siphon data somewhere off of Equifax's network, right? So did, were they able to query a back-end database directly? Like, should that front-end application have been able to communicate to that back-end database? I, again, I don't know the details of this, but the idea is we need to, for applications to be able to protect themselves, right? We need to be able to say to this database server, you only have five or 10 upstream consumers. There's no need to expose your network ports to the entire production network. Um, so this is kind of like applications creating their own DMZ, so to speak, to the call graph. Um, I'm going to go through the second part somewhat quickly. Um, I'm not a network engineer. Um, we're going to be looking at the spine and leaf network architecture that Nina briefly touched on in the, in the previous discussion. You can drop distributed firewall into any organization to complement your existing security measures, right? So if you're already using network firewalls, that's great. You could take the solution. It's a purely software-based solution 
no additional hardware required and drop it in. LinkedIn moved to the spine and leaf network architecture and because of that, it necessitated this technology. So again, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on here, but this is an image of how we traditionally uh, organize our production networks and this is similar to most companies, right? The, the different groups you're seeing here, the green, the blue, and the purple, I know this may be difficult to see, uh, but these are logically security zones. So let's say the, the green is like a development environment and the blue is production and the purple is data processing or something like that, right? Uh, we don't allow these environments to communicate to each other by default. We, we have network firewalls in place and you can kind of see at the top of the image, they're going to the CRT device. Uh, these are big iron uh, Cisco Juniper routers, right? These are hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars of machines. Um, this is the network scaled vertically. And I, I think that most companies organize their networks in this way. Um, there's a lot of downsides to this architecture. Uh, specifically, the CRT device here is the network bottleneck or the choke point between communication between two devices. So again, uh, if I'm in the green cube here, and I want to connect to like a prod server that's in this blue area. Uh, my packet's got to go up the stack, hit the CRT where it, all the ACLs are then processed. And then finally it bubbles down to the server. Um, but what, another thing you'll see here, and again, I'm sorry if this is difficult to read, uh, but the server on the left side of the blue uh, bucket and the server on the right side of the blue bucket can communicate without going through the CRT device, right? So. Um, this, is, this is a major problem, and the only way that we can provide a network firewall here is the second row is the DMZ, right? So we actually have to organize our network to, to provide this network filtering with these firewall devices. Um, and logically, we want to be able to do this in software. So some downsides here, right? Um, if, if we're having these CRTs as physical and logical choke points, this becomes an incredibly difficult problem for humans to solve because what we found at LinkedIn is that the CRT devices were holding tens of thousands of network ACLs. And if I'm a network administrator and I have to insert a new ACL, I have to fit the entire security model into my head to figure out exactly where a rule needs to be inserted, how it needs to be inserted. And there could be multiple network firewalls in the way. So between machine A and machine B communicating, there could be four or five firewalls that need to be modified in order to let that traffic flow through. Um, so this is taking our uh, network engineering team an incredible amount of effort to solve these problems. And another downside is that the, the CRT device is a single point of failure, right? So if I insert a bad ACL at the CRT, it's now affecting you know, thousands or tens of thousands of devices behind it. Um, it's, a, it's a big bang deployment. So. Um, Finally, um, we're doing this in hardware. So we have to buy these extremely massive switches because we need large TCAM table size in the ASICs in order to hold our entire uh, ACL complexity. So this is kind of uh, taking this uh, concept of a cluster, um, like the production cluster, and we have multiple clusters per data center. Um, another problem that we had here is because our, our firewall complexity is so large, we can't fit every single ACL into every single CRT. So LinkedIn's had several instances where we've had to shift traffic and fail traffic between data centers. And when that happens, the traffic in the new data center may not have ACLs that existed in the, in the CRTs at the previous data center. Um, so anytime we add a new data center, if we spin up a new facility, uh, this became a event where we were firing off tens of thousands of new ACL requests. The previous data centers needed to start trusting the new data center. Um, the, the complexity here was just rising astronomically as we were trying to scale. So this is the image that uh, Nina shared before. This is actually off of Facebook's uh, site. I thought this was a great three-dimensional image. This is the concept of a pod. So instead of scaling vertically with the network architecture, um, we can take smaller switches provide multiple paths and scale this out horizontally. So one thing that was really critical to LinkedIn is um, before when we were deploying clusters, these were massive installations. And we're, we're talking about you know, 1,000 machines or 5,000 or 10,000 machines per cluster. And what we were seeing is in the data center space, maybe we had space for 
two or three additional racks, or maybe we had a, a power that we left stranded or cooling. Um, and it wasn't enough resources to build a new cluster, right? So we ended up abandoning this space in the data center. And this ended up costing the company millions of dollars because you know, when you're talking about a server, a single one use server, maybe these cost a few thousand dollars. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'll have the figures off the top of my head. Uh, but the, the space that the machine occupies in the data center, the facilities, the, the, the cooling, the power, um, all of that is 10x the actual cost of the hardware that we're putting in there. So we have to fully utilize this. You know, we need to be able to have the capability and the flexibility to install one or two more cabinets to, to take advantage of that. So um, I'm going to briefly go over uh, Project Altair, which was how LinkedIn did their spine and leaf. Um, if you're interested in Project Altair, I have a references slide that has a lot more information here. Um, this is trying to simplify this architecture and what it looks like. So the top of the rack switch here is connecting the four different fabrics. Um, these are all interconnected. So here we have uh, you know, top of rack switch one to 2000. They connect it to the leaf, which connects the spine, which then creates fabrics. And uh, finally, at this slide, um, we in our in our latest facility, we installed 2,400 switches, and we're able to support 100,000 bare metal machines here. Um, but the most critical part of this is that there's multiple paths now between machines. So, failover of a single router or a single device, um, we're able to to find different alternate paths for machines to communicate. So we went with a single single SKU switch. Um, this is our uh, Project Falco, which is our Linux-based switch. So this was the leaf, the uh, spine, and the fabric level switch. Um, all the same SKU, just configured a bit differently. And here we try to simplify this. Um, I could spend an entire hour just talking about this, so unfortunately I'm going to move on. Um, but this is the, the high-level general concept of spine and leaf network architecture. So this, this became a major uh, issue for us because what you just looked at was the physical network, how machines are physically wired to, to communicate to each other. But what you're missing in here is that we didn't see the logical disconnect, right? And in the previous thing, we saw you know three different security zones. We saw like a development environment and a production environment and data processing. All of these things have to coexist in the same physical network. So how are we going to do this? We need to be able to mix and match hardware because, um, for example, our data processing nodes, maybe they're uh, I.O. intensive. We have eight or ten drives installed into them. And so their power requirements are a lot different than, say, our production servers or QA servers. So if we're able to mix and match data processing and production and staging, um, we're able to fully utilize the power and, and cooling and space that we have in the data center. So this leads to distributed firewall. What is this? This is um, this is software-defined networking, right? So this is uh, taking the concept of a DMZ and adding an additional layer here to say, I'm going to create a new security profile per application. Um, the way we're going to do this is that we're going to try to simplify this as much as possible. We're always going to allow outbound. We're always going to allow loopback. Um, but for our incoming traffic, we're going to go into a deny by default stance. And we're going to require the business to actually whitelist what their applications are going to use. As, as deployment actions happen, as the network changes, as IPv6 comes online, um, the data center is constantly evolving. We need the distributed firewall to be able to become aware of these changes and apply them in a just and automatic way. So uh, this isn't a new firewall technology. Specifically at LinkedIn, we're using uh, IP filter and NFT tables as the underlying implementation. Uh, distributed firewall is basically the automation piece that resides on top of these lower level firewalling technologies. So you could theoretically expand this to packet filter or Windows firewalls or really any other software uh, firewall um, or hardware firewall technology. Uh, Intel Flow Director um, being able to, to program rules directly into Intel Next actually looks really, really interesting. So what are some advantages that we get here? Um, the CRT was a single device, right? Maybe this was a multi-million dollar big iron Cisco switch, but it was still a single device, right? It still had a single CPU. If we're able to take this complexity of firewalling and shard it out to and down to the per node, we really have unlimited resources at our disposal. We have 
all the CPU, you know, the network pipes go out. Um, we have disk IO logging. You know, we were able to fully utilize the, the, the processing power that our servers had to kind of solve this networking issue. Our, um, the switches that our machines talk to, the top of the rack switches, they define the security zone that the machine is connected to. And we do this by network uh, link aggregation. So we'll say, for example, a large network block space like a slash 12 or slash 14, you know, this makes up a production network. And if the source machine belongs to you know, this, this large block of address space, I can trust it as a production host. So we depend on these VLANs to kind of define what the host belongs to. Um, finally, we import what we call the call graph. So LinkedIn has thousands of applications, and those thousands of applications have, you know, millions of ways that they interconnect and communicate with each other. Um, but it's actually quite limited, right? So maybe there's a database that only has five or 10 upstream consu consumers. So we want to be able to limit the applications to only respond to those. Logically, um, this simplified things for us quite a bit. So we took the, the CRT that had tens of thousands of ACLs, and if we shift that logic down to the per node level, um, the node itself actually becomes quite simple. You know, we have 100 rules here. Um, what we're seeing in, in production is actually far less than that. Um, we need to be able to work with operations here. So one thing that was kind of frustrating with us anyways is because uh, network engineering administrated the firewalls, um, quite often like a bad ACL would get pushed and folks in operations would be impacted by that, right? We need to be able to empower operations to, to work with the firewall instead of against it. We, we actually came up with some new business capabilities here that we didn't have before. Um, before, uh, we could do something called black holing now. This is kind of a limited use feature, but let's say we have a, a, a misbehaving application like Kafka or Apache, right? And there's a memory leak or something, something bad's happening with it. Um, it's, it actually has some value to leave the application up and running and not shut it down because that gives engineering like a JVM that they could attach to or a machine that they can analyze for live state. So we can actually go into DFW and insert a port here, leave the application online and running, but it stops taking that traffic. It, it basically removes it from service. Um, another example is QoS. So Apache Kafka can uh, be extremely network IO. Um, and if we're going through extreme bursts of uh, traffic, we still need to be able to SSH to those machines or you know, allow Zookeeper to run because uh, we can't saturate other applications out. And Pinhole, uh, I talked about this before, but being able to limit who is able to connect to me by uh, consuming this call graph data. Some uh, other features that kind of came out of this that were unexpected was the ability to decommission data centers. So um, in the past year, we've, we've entered and exited a few facilities. And the best metaphor, I think, for a data center is like an aircraft carrier, right? It's, it, it has tens of thousands of machines running all these applications. They're communicating with other production data centers. And taking a data center offline can actually be severely production impacting. Um, so when we use distributed firewall, um, we're able to tell our operations personnel, you know, you don't have to shut down your applications. You can just go communicate to distributed firewall, leave the application up and running, um, but reject all inbound and outbound application traffic. And this way you can still SSH to the machine, um, that you could quickly take DFW offline and allow the machine to resume normal traffic. The process has never stopped. Um, this allowed us to decommission a fairly large production data center um, in a matter of days instead of weeks or months. So um, with uh, connection tracking, um, you now can actually see what is calling your application. That's actually kind of a hard problem. Um, engineers often write APIs that um, maybe they don't fully understand who's hitting their service. And with connection tracking, you can actually see and enhance the call graph by understanding who's calling your service. And, and finally, IPv6 support came for free. So when we were talking about the CRT devices and their TCAM tables, um, when LinkedIn was an IPv4 only shop, all of our ACLs were fitting in the TCAM table size for just V4. When we start looking at moving the V6, now we're like duplicating or maybe 3x or 4x the amount of memory space in these TCAM tables to support the V6 address space. Um, with distributed firewall, this is done in software. And specifically, we use something called IP sets. 
IP set is a container, so to speak. So when we have a rule in IP tables, we'll say, this is the high level objective of what I'm trying to accomplish. And I reference an IP set. And that one IP set, a list set, may reference 100 other IP sets. The IP set contains the, the, the how this rule works. The IP tables rule is the high level, what am I trying to do? Um, and when v6 support, the reason why I say this came for free is because as quad A records are being populated in DNS, as v6 net blocks are coming online, um, this is all being inserted into our central source of truth and distributed out through a distributed firewall. Um, so the firewall basically grows as v6 traffic increases automatically. So AcleDB, um, AcleDB is our central source of truth of how all of this works. Um, it works by querying multiple sources of truth at LinkedIn and basically generates a JSON data container. Um, we then use uh, the configuration management and CF Engine automation to transfer these JSON data containers down to the per host level. Um, we then consume that within DFW to build the unique uh, firewall per machine. This also um, builds the concept, since we're in a deny by default state, we now have to say, you know, Apache listens on port 80, SSH listens on port 22, um, Kafka listens on port 9000, right? So we actually have to define into the source of truth what listens to what, and this is kind of how we register it. And finally, um, there's the inter-security zone communication. This is what you would typically think of a firewall rule, you know, allow data processing to, to reach into prod to communicate to a Kafka or, or Espresso. Um, reach across the security boundaries. So high level, um, what do we do here? We, we only filter on inbound traffic. We never filter outbound. And the reason why is to simplify the complexity. So imagine um, you're debugging two applications communicating to each other, application X and Y. And maybe application X has 100 machines or 1,000 machines. And application Y has 1,000 machines. And let's say 50% of the traffic's being dropped, right? How, do you, how would you debug this? If you were filtering on outbound, you may not know the source machines, right? You know the destination machines. So by filtering inbound, um, we always can go to the destination machine and see the traffic being dropped there. Um, coming from the, the aspect where only network firewalls were in play, and maybe there were four or five network firewalls between two machines communicating, at any point along that path, a firewall could be dropping a packet silently, and you just never see the traffic on the destination node. Um, here, you, we will always see um, the traffic being dropped at the destination machine. And finally, um, we had to build safeguards here. So the scary part about um, distributed firewall, I don't want to say scary, but a real threat, is that we are having system automation define network paths. And we could have catastrophic failure to say, um, you know, production VLANs no longer exist, right? And then all of a sudden, prod to prod communication stops happening. And the, 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 the actual worst nightmare I had in designing this was, what if 10,000 or 30,000 or 100,000 machines stop being able to communicate? We can't pull um, automation updates anymore. We can't administrate distributed firewall. Um, so we did have to build some safeguards into this to, to validate that even in the case of catastrophic failure, we would always have automation control. We would always be able to SSH. We'd always be able to use sudo to um, gain root access on machines. So the, the high-level architecture, um, we covered the pre-security zone earlier in kind of the new business capabilities. Um, there's, there's really three layers here. So um, what are some new things that we can do with host-based firewalls that we couldn't do before with network-based firewalls? Um, the security zone is mimicking what the firewall was providing to us before. So the firewall was saying allow prod to prod to communicate to each other. That's the same concept here, is that we say if the source machine connecting to us belongs to a production VLAN, um, forward it to a new IP tables chain, and then I could say um, if I enter this chain, accept from any. And, and this is logically saying you know, allow Apache access from prod to prod. And finally, post security zone. Um, this is what you would typically think of firewall rules, where we're crossing boundaries between security zones. Um, a, a, another important concept here is because we're using list sets, um, each machine has 
two, two network stacks, right? There's a V4 and a V6 network stack. Um, and the two firewalls are actually administrated independently of each other. But because we're using IP tables and uh, IP set list sets, the rule that we're placing in both of these are exactly identical. Uh, where we differentiate between V4 and V6 is the members of the IP sets. 99.999% of the change that happens in, D in DFW are changes members moving in and out of these IP sets that the IP tables rules themselves really aren't changing. The, the IP sets contain who's allowed to access me, what net blocks am I going to trust, what, what destination ports am I going to accept. So um, we're completely stateless here. Every time DFW executes, um, we take the data that was delivered to us and we compute the rule set from scratch. Uh, we compare it to live state and then we do IP set swaps um, to promote membership change or we uh, promote a new IP tables configuration. So another thing that was really cool about IP sets is let's say, um, let's just take an example here. Let's say I have a MySQL database and I have uh, a, an application of 10 upstream consumers. And let's say LinkedIn goes and deploys 100 new upstream consumers of this, right? So now my, my MySQL database needs to accept 100 machines instead of 10. Um, when this happens in distributed firewall, we build a new IP set, and then the IP set swap command takes the new IP set that we built and the one that's in memory and swaps in in an atomic way. So this action happens instantaneously. Um, you could theoretically log into a machine, get root, flush IP tables, flush IP sets, um, and the next execution of distributed firewall, it's going to blow it, whatever you did away and uh, rebuild to known good state. So um, debugging is really simple here, right? Um, there's, we don't have to figure out a previous state issue. You run distributed firewall, figure out if traffic's being dropped, and then realize you have to whitelist something. So this is really important. Um, we needed to be able to wait to work with asynchronous actions, work with humans, work with other automation systems. Um, and here's a few examples here, right? So. Let's say I'm in operations and engineering pushes a code change, and let's say they started listening on port 10,000 and didn't give operations a heads up, right? They, they started creating a new traffic flow. Um, they push their code to prod, and all of a sudden prod's breaking because their application's not working. Um, operations is able to log in and uh, interact with IP sets that sit empty. Basically, automation is saying, here is an API that you can hit. Here is a container that you can hit. If you add ports or if you add information to these IP sets, I will respect it and work with you. So it gives humans a way of interacting uh, with this distributed system. Um, example two, we kind of discussed before where we have an application that's misbehaving. We don't want to shut it down, but we want it to stop taking uh, production traffic. And finally, um, the third one is kind of a chicken and an egg problem. So. We're, deploy we're depending on our CMDB, our application deployment system, to define um, what applications belong to which machines. Um, but when we push code to those machines, we want them to work immediately. The, the automation pipeline that detects when a deployment happened and to deliver this updated data to distributed firewall may be in the order of minutes, right? And we don't want our applications to not function for minutes. Um, so our automated uh, application deployment system can interact with DFW, whitelist traffic immediately, and then when the automation pipeline catches up, cleans up after this. Um, finally, some references. Um, if you're interested in talking or learning more about the spine and leaf network architecture that LinkedIn did, um, there's a great presentation here on Project Altair. Um, Facebook has had some wonderful uh, blog posts and this uh, YouTube video here um, really hammers down how the spine and leaf network architecture is designed. These are great references. Um, and finally, um, take some questions. Um, I want to uh, point out Zanier. Um, Zanier is a company made by Northern Tech. They have created a uh, implementation of this that is unique. It is not um, the implementation that LinkedIn created. It is unique work. But it's based on these concepts and um, the same underlying technologies. So if you're interested in um, looking at Zanier, uh, Nils from Northern Tech Team is here. He'd love to talk to you guys, and you can find some more information out here. Um, finally, uh, my LinkedIn profile, if you'd like to connect, and these slides. And uh, tonight, there's a bird's a feather. So if you'd like to talk more about this in an informal setting, have some drinks, um, talk about distributed networking, uh, please join us.
So that'll start some questions. Thank you very much, Mike, for the can't stop doing that. Uh, questions, please come to the mic as before. Hi. Um, uh, you mentioned there's uh, there's mechanisms in DFW to um, uh, to deal with you know errors you know uh, recovery of of uh, you know mistakes going out in the configuration. Uh, are any of those processes uh, feedback mechanisms? You mentioned connection tracking as something that you do. So if someone were to you know push out an errant rule and suddenly you know you get connection trees, you, you see like the, the number of uh, dropped connections, you know, spike, does it have a way to like, well, that was bad, and they go back to the old configuration or something, or, or I wait, I can't SSH anymore, and they go back to the old configuration. Does it do anything like that? There's a lot of monitoring that we have around this that we graph. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer your question in a way that I'm, without disclosing something that I shouldn't. <laughs> um, Let's just put it that there's um, a lot of monitoring around here, and there is the ability to roll back to a previously known good state. Um, I, I think I'll just have to leave it at that. I'm sorry. Uh, hey, Mike. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I uh, just wanted to say my name is Niels, uh, Roger Nielsen. Uh, I've been talking a little bit with Mike about this stuff. Uh, I'm from Zener, and I uh, just wanted to uh, point out, as Mike said, that We'll be doing a, a birds of a feather session, so I'm really looking forward to more questions about this and more discussions about where we can take this as well in the future. And uh, as a question for you, and, and maybe as a as a uh, <clears throat> to pique some interest for for that session tonight, maybe you have some ideas about where you could take this further for LinkedIn as well. What are the what are the next steps uh, for you guys? So thank you very much. We have a question coming up. Great. Hi, so I have two questions. One is, uh, are these slides available somewhere? Because that's a nice list of references. Yeah, um, the slide share link right there, and they're also on my LinkedIn profile. OK, so. great. And the other question is, you mentioned CF Engine for pulling the JSON files mm -hmm. from your ACLDB. And I, wanted, I was just curious what role CF Engine plays in the IP table sets uh, convergence model. CF Engine is a critical component to this infrastructure. It is basically uh, the glue that holds this together. Um, DFW is, is automation that we've leveraged CF Engine, the underlying technology, to execute on. Um, but the, the concepts behind Promise Theory, the work of Mark Burgess, and uh, convergence to a known good state um, were critical to, to DFW being a success at scale. So um, the, the Zener technology incorporates a lot of these underlying uh, technologies to make this work in a production-ready environment. So, thank you. Hi, Mike. Great talk. Thank, thank you. you. Um, did you guys uh, investigate like doing overlays in NFV before you went down the host-based route? I'm sorry. Could you like uh, uh, you know like a way to do a you know, to get the traffic to like a, a network functions virtualization type of firewall, do you guys use like VXLAN overlays or anything to like route the? Tr did you think about it before you went this? So route? doing kind of this concept um, at the switch layer, I think is that what you're trying to no, say? No, it's it's like you know, kind of like a virtualized firewall instance where you you overlay the traffic over to it and route it through it. Uh, a lot of telcos do it. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I guess I just I'm not quite conceptually okay. understanding. I, I just it was just uh, to do it on a host base. It, it seems like uh, it was interesting to me that you guys went host base instead of doing uh, like kind of overlay routed thing. Okay. So. Thanks. I have a question. Um, I guess uh, if a bad actor got onto one of your machines and mm -hmm. began to turn off those firewalls uh, and then started rooting around, is it the hope that the company policy of the default inbound 
is like the thing that's going to protect a bad actor from, you know, doing an inspection. Right. So if someone hacks a machine basically and gets root and flushes IP tables, um, yes, that one machine would basically be running um, exposed, so to speak. But all of the other machines in production would not be compromised. In, in the reverse, if you look at uh, the CRT level where we were doing firewall filtering at the top of the network, if you compromise that firewall device, the entire production network would be wide open. Um, so the way we address this is that we actually monitor for keep alives and health checks. So distributed firewall needs to send a heartbeat every few minutes. And when this heartbeat goes away, the network can respond to that. So you know we could look at the switch port going into a quarantine status and removing that device from the network, so to speak. So this kind of becomes an interplay of systems and the network switches becoming aware of uh, participation. Is there any worry that like a very savvy player who's rooted that box might spoof some of those you know, health checks to like make it seem like it's still happy, but not? Yeah, I mean, there's this takes security uh, in a, a different direction, right? And there are a lot of concerns that um, our house security team has has looked at with this and we're working on. Um, I don't think I can go much further than that, but there's a lot of automation that detects when, when this participation stops happening. Thank so. you. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, the first is how, are, how do you deal uh, with the log aggregations between all the host firewalls, uh, the deny logs, uh, for example, uh, since it's not uh, on the on a central uh, on the CRT level, but distributed on all hosts. And my second question is: Did you see or notice any um, any performance hit on the host level uh, when you activated the firewalling? <coughs> Um, so the first question, the logging, um, we did write, we, we were looking at like syslog, but then we realized that we didn't want to flood syslog with terabytes of uh, IP tables logging traffic, right? Um, so we do use uh, ulogd. Ulogd is a separate user space daemon that connects to a socket and basically pulls the message out of the kernel and then puts it on disk. Um, we wrote a uh, in-house daemon that basically uh, reads these events and then sends them to a centralized location to where we can then process them. So it, the, the concept is very, is very similar to centralized logging. Mm -hmm. um, it's just using a separate infrastructure stack, so to speak. Um, and what was your second question again? I'm sorry. The second question is uh, when you activated firewalling on the host level, did you have any performance or? <laughs> the only performance impact that we had, um, so there's two ways of running firewalls. One is, one is called stateful, and this is connection tracking to where the machine remembers the mach who's, who's talking to it, right? So that's stateful. And then there's stateless. And stateless means um, I don't care about previous history. Every packet has to traverse the IP tables rule set. And with connection tracking, the, we saw an issue with connection bursts. So if we had an application that got pounded by, let's say, 30,000 requests by you know, an entire data center in a few seconds, um, those connection tracking tables have to be populated in the connection tracking kernel module. And if that's not populated fast enough, packets ended up getting dropped on the floor as drops. So there were a few applications where we realized that they had these spikes of mass. It wasn't really the number of clients connecting. It was the rate at which new entries were being populated. So for those applications, we had to flip over to stateless mode. Um, other than that, we haven't seen um, software-based firewalls, IP tables, NFT tables, actually uh, limiting the network performance. We can still fully saturate our network pipes. Um, it didn't add lat latency. So, okay. Thanks. You're welcome. You said something about your call graph be somehow being understandable and interpretable by your uh, switching and uh, firewall infrastructure. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the call graph is conceptually um, what communicates with which applications, right? So if you're able to say, I'm running an Apache web server, um, maybe I'm like a mid-tier application, and there's these front ends that are communicating with me. Um, that's, that's the concept of the call graph, what applications call which. 
Um, and when you have this, then you realize you don't have to expose your service to the entire production network. You only have to expose it to those upstream consumers. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's... Where is that enforcement done? At the endpoint or in the switching, in the switching fabric? It's done at the endpoint. So this data is basically generated and delivered as a JSON container. DFW consumes this data and then builds the uh, IP tables and IP set configuration to enforce that. So it's done on the end node. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? We have some time. No? Well, then, if that's all from the audience, let's thank Mike for his fascinating talk. <laughs>